of your hi everyone good afternoon i'm char nolan one of the instructors here at ruby and it is a total delight to be with you today if you ever wonder what my work area looks like when i'm looking at all of your wonderful assignments this is the spot this is where all of the action happens and um i always enjoy sitting down and reviewing everyone's assignments and I love reading the questions and I have enjoyed the questions that have been coming in today. So um, before we begin, I thought I would do a very, very quick book review because there were a lot of questions about books and it's the number one thing that people are seeing, are curious about. And it seems that these days there are so many new and exciting vegan plant-based cookbooks in the world, but I'm going to show you my tried and true. They're a dozen years old. Um, when I was a fifth grade teacher, my school head always used to say, teach what you know. So I cook what I know. And my journey to being plant-based started with Rip Esselstyn's The Engine 2 Diet. The book was published in 2009. It has become a foundation for many people who choose to eat plant-based. And you may know that Rip was a firefighter in the Austin City Fire Department. And even though I've been to Rome and I've been to the Falls G. Guasu, Going to the Engine 2 Firehouse was probably one of the top highlights of my life, and I'm being very serious when I say that. I also love the Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Cookbook by Jane and Anne Esselstyn, and this book was published in 2014 by Avery Books. Jane has a new book coming out next year, which will be another exciting book to see. This book is primarily a primer that goes along with Dr. Esselstyn's book, The Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease book. It's a great book. No oil, no oil, no oil, no salt, no sugar. Easy to follow recipes. You can tweak them. Even if you make a mistake, they still come out great. I am also a big fan of the Engine 2 cookbook, also by Rip Esselstyn and Jane Esselstyn. And I particularly love this because my very own Yo Adrian burger is featured in the cookbook. And it's a delightful oil-free burger whose base is quinoa, oats, and shredded sweet potatoes. Totally delicious. And I have two more, so thanks for being so patient. The Shares Eyes, two neurologists have a very good book, The 30 Day Alzheimer's Solution, but very good recipes, easy to follow. I have made this dessert that was on the cover, totally delicious. And last but never, ever least, I don't think I've ever told this to Chef Brian Costigan, but um, about five or six years ago, Dr. Colin Campbell was in Philadelphia and I called his producer and said, you know, you're probably eating on the road a lot. How about if my friends and I cook dinner for you and your crew? So uh, I made Fran's version of the no oil chocolate cake, which was totally delicious and totally good. What I love about this book is that Fran knows that I'm not a baker, but this book teaches me the, preci the precision and importance of following a recipe and doing everything that Fran writes in the book. And if you follow the recipes, the food will come out perfectly. So that was my question. Somebody had mentioned the Vegetarian Flavor Bible by Karen Page and her husband. Uh, also a very good book, no recipes in it, but lots of good foundation. And I say that those books for me certainly gave me the foundation that I use today in everything that I do. So. With that said, I'm going to review a couple of the questions and then take a little break. And by break, I mean I have some little items to sort of just show you and help you feel more comfortable in the kitchen. And then we're going to do a very quick overview of food photography because I, when I read your uh, assessments, many of you will say, I'm not a food photographer. Well, you don't have to be. And if you look at the summaries, it will always say photo worth two points, photo worth three points. So you really want to optimize the taking of your photo to get the best picture that you can. 
So let's look at some questions. I hope everyone's having a great day. This comes from Victoria C. Hello, Victoria, how are you? I'm having difficulty cooking some things without oil, such as pancakes, vegetable patties, frying things on stovetop. Do you have any suggestions? I'm your go-to. So what I wanted to say, first of all, is I use an air fryer. I love my air fryer. It gives me balance. It can crispify. I don't know if that's a word or not, but it can make anything crispy. And there are many, many models out on the market. I started with a small single unit uh, that has a little basket in it. And then I graduated to a Cuisinart, not to mention the brand, but it's a Cuisinart combo oven. It has, it does everything. It, it's a toaster, it's a toaster oven, it's an oven, it broils, and it happens to air fry as well. And when I'm working on the Charlie cart, which I have mentioned to many of you, the Charlie cart uses the Breville, and I actually like that one a little bit better. But back to frying, the first thing that you need is a really good pan. This is a cheap ceramic pan that I got at Aldi. And the reason why I got it is because I can use it on an induction stove, which I use when I teach out in the community, just because it's safer, no open flame in an unknown area. So this works very, very well. And if you remember back to the no oil saute uh, <clears throat> assignment, checking the heat of your pan and having a hot pan is a very good thing to have. This thing makes the best pancakes I've ever had in my life. But my pancake batter is mashed banana, some oatmeal, a little bit of vanilla, and either some plant milk or water, and then made into a, um, a dough or a, a, a liquid. And then I'll make a pancake in there using a nonstick turner. Cooking without oil also means that you can take advantage of roasting in your oven. So one of the things that I was discussing with Patrick beforehand was parchment paper. This happens to be by Reynolds, and I think Reynolds Wrap is getting into the act of wanting to provide uh, things to help you in your kitchen. And this one is unbleached and it's totally compostable. So here's the thing. Most uh, brands of parchment paper tell you not to cook higher than 450 degrees, which is true. But you also want to make certain that your parchment paper fits the roasting pan that you're working in. So what I suggest to do is you pull it off, like you would do here. I didn't want to make a ton of noise for Patrick. And then you crumple it up into a ball. And then you open it up and it looks like this. And it will stick perfectly well on your roasting pan. So lining is very, very important. If you're not into parchment paper and you want to have a little bit more, uh, shall we say, be a better environmental steward, this is a silicone mat from Foods 52. And the reason why I love it is because if you are roasting carrots or Brussels sprouts, look at the beautiful pan placement that you can have with this so that your vegetables don't touch and they can roast beautifully and deliciously. So an air fryer, a good pan, and I think that also realizing that some food textures do change without using oil. And I say that the air fryer probably uh, imitates that the best. And the first thing that I made in my uh, air fryer, just to give you a, a point, is I opened a bag of oil-free um, French fries because I figured, I don't know if I'm gonna use this, if it's really gonna work, but it worked perfectly and beautifully. So Silpat, parchment paper, a good pan. And um, <clears throat> the other thing uh, that, comes to mind is always checking the oven temperature of your oven because your readout might be more or less than what the oven is actually generating. So having the oven thermometer inside will give you that accurate temperature so that roasting where caramelization can take place on those beautiful carrots or your asparagus or whatever it is that you choose to to um, create. But I hope that answered your question. I think air fry would be the easiest uh, answer for me. Oh, look at Fran wrote, thank you. 
goodness gracious, for pancake batter, more traditional green pan. Oh, Fran uses a green span, a green pan. Uh, it's nonstick. I don't have a green pan, but I do love this. And I don't use Teflon because uh, once I went to someone's house and they had a Teflon pan and it had all of these little scratchy marks. And I thought, oh my gosh, who has eaten that Teflon? And I don't want that to be me. But yeah, friend, that's a great suggestion. The green pan, I've seen them advertised everywhere. Friend knows I'm uh, in the throes. Uh, actually, on January 3rd, we're getting a full kitchen remodel here at my house. So I'm hoping that when the kitchen is done, I can actually cook from you from my new kitchen. So now I, I am forbidden from buying anything new at all. So uh, because packing is, is not that much fun. Uh, what is the best way to sharpen your chef's knife? Do you need to buy the knife sharpener from the same company that you bought your knife from? So here's the answer. I, uh, after I wash my knife by hand, never in the dishwasher, uh, after I dry it by hand with the blade away from me, I will sharpen it so that when I put it back into its sleeve, I know that it is ready to use. Do you need to go to the company that you, who sharpened it? I recently bought myself a Cutco knife and I get a lot of emails about sharpening events I uh, haven't been to one. Uh, you can either use a whetstone. I, I don't have a, I don't have it up here with me, but I have an Emerald Lagasse tabletop knife sharpener that's easy to take along when I teach outside of my home that does a very, very good job. And when I have taken my knives to a knife guy at a farmer's market, he'll always say, well, your knives are in good condition. So I just think that it's caring for your knife, sharpening it, and not putting it in the dishwasher. I also wanted to say, you know, um, I love Ikea. And I don't know if you read that story about um, people who were stranded in an Ikea recently and they slept in the beds at Ikea. My dream kitchen actually comes from visiting Ikea maybe one too many times. But Ikea has very, very good knives. And they might be $3.99 or $4.99. And some of them that I have have lasted very, very long. And it's because I don't put them in the dishwasher. So I hope that um, that answers your question, Donna, and I hope you are enjoying it. One last thing. When I finished Ruby, uh, I really wanted to have chef, chef knife skills like a TV chef. I wanted to just chop away. And so I took an in-person knife cutting class and I found that very, very helpful so that I could see the mechanics of, you know, how my hand and knife were supposed to move on the cutting board. And that was really helpful for me. So I hope that's helpful to you as well. All right, let's go to another question. Oh, it's Fawn. Hi, Char. Uh, in encouraging people to eat more plant-based, I frequently get the response, it is too expensive. I wonder if you get this as well and how do you respond? So it's so funny, Fawn. Uh, by the way, Fawn is doing wonderful videos with her son, who is becoming an avid plant-based uh, cook, and they're very enjoyable to watch. She just started her own YouTube station, uh, or YouTube channel, I should say. So, you know, people say that because uh, prepared, processed, plant-based foods are expensive. However, if you shop the perimeters of the store or go to a farmer's market, or I, for example, shop at a place called Produce Junction because I can get uh, tons and tons of vegetables for a really good price. If you buy your vegetables in bulk, what I have found over the years, and I've been living this way for 12 years, is that people really want you to say, you know what, you are right, it is really expensive. But I don't do that. And I've stopped giving my lecture about how much cheaper eating plant-based is than a day in the hospital, because that, that will keep your friends away forever. So I think the best thing to do is to make them a lovely casserole and bring it over and say, this thing costs $6.33 to make, because, Think about it, bulk of beans, rice, and fresh vegetables are relatively inexpensive, nutrient dense. People don't want to hear that. They, they, they still want you to say to them, you know what, you're right. And maybe sometimes you just have to cook for them and they can taste your delicious food. Keep up the good work for when you're doing a great job. So 
Oh, this is, uh, is there a way to make whole food plant paste puff pastry sheets that are still flaky? Stop the music. I don't, I don't bake, but the person to ask would be Fran Costigan. Um, I do see online a lot of, um, plant-based bakers who use uh, ready-made puff pastry. But I think if you really wanted to have something uh, specific, Fran has an event tomorrow. And even though it's on cocoa powder, you may want to ask that question to her because I don't know the answer. Sounds delicious though. Oh, without vegan butter or oil. Wow. That sounds very scientific to me. I, I don't know what the answer would be. I don't know, but that's a good question. Moving on. Thank you very much, Tabby, for that question. So this is from Elise who says, regretfully, I won't be able to attend the session today. Uh, what's a good strategy for taking quizzes and the tests? So as a former school teacher, and um, just recently, I finished a very rigorous one-year program. Uh, I'm very old school. I like a five by seven inch uh, index card. And I take notes on things that I don't know. In other words, uh, if you're very secure about the temperatures and the methods for roasting vegetables, if you're a psychomotor learner in your brain, you're going to remember everything that you have to do. If the knife diagram is something that you can't remember where the parts are, then I would draw my own uh, knife and, you know, label the parts and do it that way. But notes and uh, I'm really aging myself here because when I was a Ruby student seven years ago, I printed out every single assignment because I like a highlighter. It's how I learn. It's what works best for me. And I also printed out all of the quizzes because I use them to study for my big final exam. And um, that's what worked for me. We all have different learning styles. I think you've heard me say before, I'm a psychomotor learner. I learn by doing. And that's why Ruby for me was so uh, fun and attractive because rather than reading about how to make a chocolate ganache, I got to experience it. And then through those steps, they kind of just stuck in my brain. But that's a very good question. Take notes if you like printouts, index cards whatever works best for you. It's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, this is from Dr. Jacqueline Zaleski. Any ideas on unusual pan and plate enhancements, serving meals two or three times a day in a lockdown since March, 2020 has been a brain drain. Well, you know, they say variety is the spice of life, but sometimes a grain of rice is a grain of rice. Um, I think that you have to cook what you like. If you live with other people, ask them for their input, ask them to cook, uh, visit different websites and see if there's a new, new spin that you can add to the chana masala that you have been making for the last 18 months. But I think a lot of us kind of uh, feel that, uh, but I think that if you have been eating this way for 20 months, you're probably a very, very healthy person. So I will say that to you. Thank you for your question. So this is from Sherry B. Uh, it's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, when I was in Italy, uh, they made an amazing lemon sauce of some sort of gluten-free pasta. Do you have an idea of what the sauce was? Well, if you were in Italy, my sense would be that there was some olive oil in it and you probably tasted some very delicious lemons. If I were going to make a lemon sauce, uh, <clears throat> I would probably have, it would probably have garlic and onions in it, much like the dry saute that you use for the uh, mushroom, no oil saute. And I would build a sauce on that. 
using fresh lemon juice and making a roux and then making a sauce from that. And my other hunch is that um, I should probably invest in a company that sells uh, nutritional yeast because I do use it for everything. It adds color. It's packed with vitamin B12. And uh, I'm never going to say, oh, it tastes like cheese. Because to me, it really doesn't taste like cheese, but it does give a very nice salt umami to it. So lemons saute with some uh, garlic and onions and then other spices and things like that. But that I think that would be a fun thing to experiment with, though, and uh, come up with your own sherry bee lemon sauce. I think that would be good. Very good question. And hopefully when the world's at a better place, my dream is to travel to the land of my grandparents who are from Apulia. And I have converted every recipe that my grandmother ever made. But there's a cooking school in Apulia. And my, my goal is to spend a week there learning some of the traditional dishes that my grandmother made, only giving it a whole food plant-based spin on it. Hi. My name is Jennifer. I would like to make cooking my passion and profession. In these times where food shortage is occurring, what would that be reasonable to open a food business? You know, Jennifer, I, I can't answer that question. Um, I have seen great success from some people who have um, started making you know, their favorite dish in an incubator kitchen, and then all of a sudden they have a... Uh, brick and mortar. I think it depends what kind of business plan you develop for yourself, what your product is. And, um, you know, if you have the passion uh, and you want to feed people delicious, good food, that will follow you. So I would love to know what it is that you make. And I appreciate the fact that you're cooking with passion. I think that's really, really wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer, for writing. So let's take a two second uh, micro mini break and I'm going to just talk about food photography for a minute. And uh, one of the things uh, you'll always read in your instructor's overview is we really look for photos that have bright and direct light. And uh, sometimes we see, you know, your shadows in the photos and it makes it really difficult to assess that final photo. So I just wanted to go over a couple of things. And Patrick is going to bring up a photo of um, a homemade white box. In a homemade white box, I made this from a dish pan and I cut holes out on either side so that the light can come in. And this is where I take most of my photos. Uh, and if there is, you'll see I have positioned a bowl of peppers in there and you're saying to yourself, but gee, you couldn't really submit that to be your grade at Ruby. But then all of a sudden, that's what the final dish looks like. So this cost a dollar to make. You can go online and spend up to 40 or $50 to, uh, to make one. Here are those beautiful peppers. I also picked some kale, the last of the kale from my garden today. But this is what it looks like. It's just two holes in it. It takes amazing, amazing photos. But it also does something really, really good when you're taking your photos. So I have this little box. And I'm going to do a quick show and tell. It has some duct tape. Why do you have duct tape? I'll tell you in a second. It has a ruler. Why? Uh, I took a food photography course when I was a student at the University of the Arts, and I thought that I had taken the most beautiful photo ever. And the instructor came over and she said, you need a ruler. And I was like, why? And she said, because your spoon is crooked. And she was right. So if I really want to line something up, the other thing is, you know, when I was a student at Ruby, I, I had this vision that I was going to cook for people and I was going to teach people. And um, I never knew that somebody would see a photo of mine and say, gee, would you like to do a TV spot here in Pittsburgh on uh, squash or whatever? So your photos speak for themselves. You want them to be the best that they can. So there's that ruler. I have some forceps 
these are good for two things. They're really good for removing a piece of burnt food from your dish, which does happen sometimes. But they're also really good for plating and meticulously adding, let's say, some microgreens to the top of a dish that you might have made. And I also have a couple of clips because, and I'll show you in a minute. And then today I happen to have a little um, kerchief bandana napkin that if I want to change the boring white of something, I can add some material. <clears throat> but the other thing is, aside from having a white box, these, and Patrick has a photo that he can show you of, uh, <clears throat> this is a backdrop. These are available uh, on Amazon. We have the link for you. You'll see it in a minute. So that's the wide shot. Uh, it's made of oak tag. Uh, you get two of them in a set. Each one is two-sided. Um, there's wood, there's marble, there's barnyard or whatever. Um, they're about $15. I've had mine for two years. Uh, you can even wash them if you need to. And Patrick, and that's the close-up of it. It looks like I am out in a barn someplace and that I am taking this amazing photo. The funny part is, is that uh, if I took the photo in my kitchen, you may have been distracted by um, the canister that I have for all of my utensils or the brand of maple syrup that I might be using. And I did want to show you one other thing is that if you happen to be at your favorite hardware store, this is, these are 18 inch tiles and they have glue on, you know, on the back, you peel them off and then you make a reversible tile one is light gray one is dark gray and this makes a perfect backdrop for any photo that you want to take so those are just a couple of photo tips and the paper clips are very good if you have to clip down the paper from that uh, oak tag thing and the other thing i want to say is when you get to your little work spot have pre-cut your uh your duct tape because it's one less thing that you have to do. And when I arrive out, I take all of my food photos on my side porch. I know the lighting of the day when it's going to be good, when it's not going to be good. Uh, but I head out there and that's when I take my photos and I don't want to make 17 trips. And then the other good thing about this little can, this little dish basin is that this becomes my carrier. So when I head out to the porch to take my photos, I only have to make one trip. And that's the truth, Ruth, as they say. That's what Spike Lee says every day on social media. So those are a quick, a couple of quick tips. The one thing I did want to say, and you don't have to be good at math. I'm not good at math. Um, if you're going to take a close-up, you saw that, for example, the finished bowl of the peppers was taken at a 45 degree angle. And uh, if you're going to take a picture of your mise en place, you want to take a, an overhead or a flat lay so that we can see everything that's in the picture. So light is the most important thing. And that white box cost me a dollar, soon to be a dollar 25 because I do hear that the dollar stores are going up in price. Okay. Uh, Patrick did post the available background, so if you're interested in that. And Sherry B says, uh, thank you for your book reviews. Any way you could post those titles? I'm very interested in all the books. I will, uh, I actually have the books on a document. I'll send them to Patrick and he can post them. But I'll, re I'll review the names of those books again. The Engine 2 Diet, it was printed in 2009 by Hatchet, is the uh, publisher. Then the Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Cookbook uh, was printed in 2014 by Avery Press. And uh, Fran's book came out, uh, let's see, it's when I was taking the E. Cornell class. So it came out around uh, 2013 and it's by Running Press, which was in Philadelphia. In fact, Fran came to Philly before she moved here to do a book signing. And we were um, going to the book publisher because we were short on books. 
And a friend had never driven with me before, but it's a good thing she was from New York because I made a U-turn on one of the busiest streets in Philadelphia so that we could get the books and go to a very, for, it was her premiere inaugural book signing here in Philadelphia. And she lived to tell the tale, lived to tell the tale. It looks like Patrick has been very, very diligent and he is putting those books up for you. So, uh, hello, Dr. Jacqueline. Uh, I'd like to own one copper pan. Is that a brand and size that you suggest that does not require taking out a mortgage? You know, uh, I live near a town called Media, Pennsylvania, and it has a free shop. And uh, my daughter is a fan of the free shop, and she knows to look for a copper pan for me. So maybe you could do the same so that you don't have to take out a mortgage. But then... If it's something that you want to cook with, uh, have that investment be something that is worthwhile to you. I don't have any copper uh, pots and pans. Cutting with knives. This is from Victoria. Hello, Victoria. Um, how to get used to cutting a different way. Well, I'm going to give you the easiest way to do it. Uh, you go to a market. Uh, I go to. I went to H Mart, the world's largest uh, pan Asian grocery store, where they sell gigantic, gigantic carrots. The carrots are the size of. They're just gigantic, and I bought gigantic carrots, and I practiced on the gigantic carrots so that I would get better at cutting. And one of the things that I hear this from many different students is that in the beginning. Cutting seems like such a chore, but then you realize that good cutting enhances the beauty of the dish that you are making. And um, I have a very good friend who's a chef and we worked together uh, <clears throat> for a couple of years and I used to hate, I, I didn't like going out to dinner with him because he would always comment on, oh, the cuts on the salad are terrible. And now I find that I have become the same person because the cuts, enhance the beauty, but also the flavor. And if you are making a stock, uh, it enhances uh, the color differently. If you're going to cut carrots in a round cut uh, that are, you know, an inch thick, your broth isn't going to be, or your stock isn't going to be as brightly orange as if you had maybe used a, a, a dice or whatever. It takes practice. You know, it's like the old joke, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, 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 but make it fun. And um, celery is another good vegetable to practice with because it's got that arch and you've got to figure out a way to make it, you know, a good, di a good dice. But practice is the only thing that I can tell you. Uh, this is from Mary Ellen. I find a lot of whole, whole food plant-based recipes use coconut milk and curries. Um, what have you found is the best substitute Perhaps one that's low in fat, cashew cream is healthier, but still quite rich. So I can answer that question. When um, when Rip and Jane were writing this book, I did some recipe testing for them, and I had to do uh, a dish that had a coconut flavor to it. And so I used a coconut extract. So co a good quality coconut extract. They have a glycerin base, but the amount of glycerin in them, because you're only using maybe 15 cc's, uh, 15 milliliters, whatever, in that recipe. But it does enhance and give it that same delicious coconut flavor. Um, if I have a recipe that I'm following and it calls for coconut milk or whatever, I just use the extract and it gives it the taste that I want. And then um, I'll just pour in some oat milk or almond milk or whatever it is that I like and then, you know, use that. I might, for example, if I were making an Indian dish that had garbanzo beans in it, I would take out maybe half a cup of garbanzo beans and puree them with the plant milk so that it kind of gives you that thickness that you are used to seeing when you do cook with coconut milk. I hope that helped you. Or, uh, it, it, hope that helped you. Yes, Trader Joe's, as a matter of fact, does sell nutritional yeast. It comes in that little bag that has Velcro in it. The bag can be used for many things. I think it's four ounces for $2.95. Um, 
I now, you can save those bags. And if you shop at a place where bulk has reopened, you can take that bag, cross out the uh, PLU on the back so that it doesn't get rung up. Uh, and uh, you'll save a lot of money. It's much, much cheaper when you buy it in bulk. Trader Joe's can't keep it in stock, by the way, because people, people do two things. They buy it in bulk or they buy it and resell it uh, on places like Amazon where uh, to people who don't have a Trader Joe's near them. Hello from Montreal, gas cooking versus induction cooktop preference. Thanks. Hi, Russell. Um, Russell, I love Montreal. Uh, as a child, we went there a lot because my grandfather and his four brothers came to America and one of them said, I'm going to Montreal. So we always got to visit when we were kids. So um, in my house, I have gas. I like gas because I can regulate it. Remember, all of this is personal. Uh, but when I cook outside teaching classes, I always use an induction stove top so I don't have to have an open flame. So it depends upon what you like. The one thing is that you've got to get a whole new set of pots and pans because not all pots and pans are uh, created to go on induction. So that's the key. And I have to say, that Aldi has a great selection of induction stovetops. So I have a saucepan, a stew pot, uh, tons and tons of different things that I use. And I save them only for when I work outside the home. Hi, Char. This is from Renee S. I completed the professional training a few years ago. What's the process for repeating it? You should have received an email recently, or we will be, we have updated that program. So there will be, uh, I would go to the website. I'm not exactly sure of all the nuts and the bolts, but um, it would be great to have you back because it's always fun because there's lots of new recipes and uh, different voices in the program. So that would be great. I hope that you'll come by. Uh, Fawn is, uh, Fawn just responded to my previous question saying that's what she tells them. If you can eat dried beans and whole foods, they are very cheap. Good plan on cooking for them. Yeah, you know, I also find, Fawn, that sometimes people um, don't like to hear the word cheap. So I like to use words like economical or pocket friendly or other things like that. Because when we think of cheap food, uh, we may be thinking a lot about um, processed drive-in food that we cannot compete with because uh, people think that getting a uh, burger of some sort for 99 cents is the deal. And that, that's the competition is the fast food place that spends zillions and zillions of dollars on TV. But you know what? We'd be here all day if that, if, if this, this discussion, but keep cooking for your friends, Vaughn. You make beautiful food and uh, it's always fun to see what it is that you're making. So thank you. Brand of a good nonstick pan. I, I don't have any. Um, I enjoy cooking. I have a, a couple of pots from Great Jones. Uh, Great Jones. Um, I have a ceramic roasting pan from them that I love. And I have a stock pot from them that I'm very fond of. And I have a saute pan. But uh, I think earlier in the chat, Fran had discussed about having her green pan and that she really, really liked that. So I like ceramic pans, but I am i don't think I can answer the question about Teflon because I'm not sure of the answer. So this is from Kelly D. Good morning. I just want to confirm that we have until January 20th to submit our work for our Forks Over Knives course. I believe that is true. If you do need an extension, you can contact student services who can help answer that question for you much better than I can. I hope you're enjoying the course. It's a lot of work, but I know your families are eating well and that you're having fun, I hope. You know, before I answer Laura C's question, I want to go back to photos for one quick question. And that is that <clears throat> um, you have shopped for this meal. You have read the recipe a thousand and a half times. Um, you become one with this dish so that when you take that photo, uh, that photo is a, is a true reflection of your hard work. And always remember that when you're taking your photo. Now, Laura, I know you live in Michigan. I know it's not close to Philadelphia, but
but those Linzer torts that you posted yesterday on your Instagram, you saw I responded with a wow. Laura is an amazing, amazing chef. She's a plant pro grad and she's presently uh, with Fran Costigan in the uh, Essential Vegan Desserts. So um, now I'll read your question. I have two older friends who live far from me who are asking for a basic shopping list to get started. They are sheltering in place right now and will be ordering groceries. What would you recommend for basic forks over knives list? Um, <clears throat> You know, again, it goes back to uh, greens, grains, and beans. Uh, those are what I always tell people that they need to shop with. Uh, it would be great if you could do some sort of um, uh, virtual uh, event with them uh, just to kind of make them feel comfortable uh, because sometimes that introduction is difficult and cooking this way. So I might start with canned beans, low sodium. I love the brand called Jack's. They come in a little box. Um, they're very, very good. But I think the forks over knives list is very, very comprehensive. And that would be a great place to start. Make sure you go check out Laura's artfully plant based is her Instagram handle. But when you see those Linzer torts, those Linzer cookies, rather, you will just be like, oh my gosh, they were beautiful. So E. Cornell, I took classes with them too. Daryl, I, you know what? I did E. Cornell too. I loved E. Cornell. Uh, I felt as though it gave me supplemental information uh, that I use when I am teaching cooking. Uh, I think it's really good to have that scientific information. Uh, it was fun and it also went by very quickly. So congratulations to you. That's great. Good work, Daryl. Oh, Daryl is back. He likes cooking with carbon steel as my nonstick pans. I agree. I'm still learning with them, but they make such a difference. So Daryl brings up the best point. And the best point is that try something new, embrace what it is, and let it be your new best practice. I think that's what uh, I'm interpreting that for you, Daryl, but that's what I understood from your message. Uh, thank you for sharing, by the way. Where did you take an in-person cutting class? At the community college. Uh, one of the local community colleges here in the area has a culinary, culinary program. And um, I took my knife, my, my knife class there. And you know, when I got there, I was better than I thought. Um, but I think I wanted to uh, be like uh, Rachel Ray. If you see her cut vegetables, she has that proficiency. So. Uh, a community college might be a good place to look. I know a lot of community colleges right now are limiting uh, outside or outsourced students, but you might want to look into that. Uh, Daryl's back. I have to cook my first go-to meal and I was thinking about a gumbo. Is that acceptable? Uh, remember that the first dish doesn't have to be plant-based. It, it's what is your go-to. And one of the reasons why we ask you that for your go-to is so that you're comfortable in the kitchen, that you're doing something that you know, something that feels good to you. And then it also allows us to see how organized you are, how much you love to cook, um, how much consideration you give to plating a dish well, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that's the only time, Daryl. So it'll be interesting to see what you make. Thanks for writing. That's a great question. So Mila wants to know what my favorite milk alternative is for milk. So here's the thing. Uh, oftentimes I will make my own oat milk or I will make almond milk. Sometimes I will buy something from the grocery shelf, but almond milk is my favorite. However, I do want to say one thing. Pacific makes excellent, excellent uh, plant milks. Theirs do not have oil in them. Some of them do. They will use uh, canola, also known as grapeseed oil, uh, grapeseed oil, grapeseed oil. So um, you may want to um, think about that. But I like almond milk the best, unsweetened with vanilla. Go figure. Uh, this is from Kara H. Hello, Kara. Is there a search function in our course? Sometimes I can't remember where I read something and takes a while to review each task. I don't know the answer to that. 
So what I do know is that if I am away from my desk and on my phone and I have a question about something in Ruby, I will type in in my search engine, Ruby no oil saute, and then that recipe will pop up. And then I can read that and it will give me the information that I know. But I think uh, Patrick either knows the answer to that or someone in student services would be best prepared to answer that question. All right. Hope that helped, Kara. And it looks like um, our last question might be from Judith N. And oh, here comes more. Uh, Chef Star, thank you for your time. Do you have any suggestions for cooking for one? It is challenging to have variety. So, you know, we see this question a lot from students uh, in the program. And I always say to cut a recipe in half and eat one and freeze the other. Uh, that seems to help. Uh, I was telling one of my friends, um, when my kids were little and, you know, uh, we, my husband and I both worked outside the home and life was busy, I created with five friends and it was our meal exchange program. So in other words, if I was going to make a mulligatawny stew, I would make five servings, five, five containers of mulligatawny stew. And if somebody else was going to make um, pasta and beans, she, they would make five servings so that at the beginning of the week, you got your food and there would be the mulligatawny stew, pasta, whatever, but you only had to cook for one night. So I don't know if that sounds uh, too industrious right now since the social climate of how we live and what we do is different, but cut the recipes in half. And, you know, in my house, uh, for example, yesterday I made a big pot of soup. And now it's going to have cousin meals. Last night I just had it as plain soup. But tonight I'm going to throw some rice in it. Or tomorrow mm -hmm. night I might put some didolini in it, some holy didolini. Didolini is that little teeny Italian uh, pasta that I grew up with. Uh, so you can sort of change it up a little bit. Or if uh, what I love to do is to take a couple of handfuls of fresh spinach, put it in a bowl and then cover it with hot soup and then eat steamed spinach. And so just break things up a little bit to make it a little bit more exciting. That's what we do. Um, thanks for your good question, Judith. I appreciated it. Uh, any tips on preparing for the week ahead for a variety? Well, Xenia, yes. So it might take a little organization on your part and uh, here in, in, in our house, I have um, four weeks of, uh, I have four menus, one for week. And uh, I can draw my shopping list from it. Now it's almost second nature to me because when you eat rice, beans and greens and grains, uh, everything pretty much becomes, you know, pretty related. But um, add different colors, add diversity, cook what you like. Um, try a new recipe every week. Uh, another example would be Meatless Mondays. Every Monday has a great recipe that they publish. So go to the website of Meatless Monday and every week try a new recipe. You know, do fun things like that. But um, you never want your food to become boring because you want to look at the beautiful food that you've made and sort of reward yourself by self-complimenting what it is that you made because I think that's an okay thing to do. So I think, goodness gracious, we had so much fun today and the time went by very, very quickly. And I appreciated everyone being here today. Uh, if you want to follow me on social media, I use Instagram most of the time and I'm there as Char, C-H-A-R underscore N-O-L-A-N, which is my surname. And I post a lot of food photos and probably you'll see some of the things from today posted um, just because I want to give a huge shout out to Patrick from our um, from the studios of uh, Ruby for helping me set up and assemble everything that we needed to do today. 
special shout out to Fran for, uh, you know, always being here. It's always fun to see her. And a big shout out to all of you. I'm sending loads of love, lots of cheer for the new year. And that's all for today. Happy holidays.